Well, hello everybody, and thanks for joining us for HydroTerra's webinar series. Today we're continuing the theme about plastics. You'll recall a couple of weeks ago, we had a really interesting talk on plastics in soil, and out of that it became apparent that there was a lot of interest in this problem. And so today we're joined by Ricky Herzberg, who's Executive Director of Plastic Oceans Australasia. And he's going to talk to us about plastic, all things plastic, but in particular, the oceans. And I will get into the detail of that shortly. All right, so I've introduced Ricky. A little bit about Ricky. As Executive Director of Plastic Oceans Australasia, Ricky has been instrumental in building the POA Foundation by inspiring people from all walks of life to join this determined cause. In the past five years, Ricky has forged positive change by creating a community collective worldwide, starting her plastics journey as a teenager working with her family's plastic recycling business she has devoted her career to drive systemic change in the corporate community, government, and not-for-profit sectors. Ricky has a diverse professional background from delivering environmental education programs, such as the Asia Pacific Healthy Oceans Campaign for Schools, Women on the Waves Movement in British Columbia, Canada to environmental accreditation platforms for the development industry in Australia, to name just a few. Along with other senior positions with World Wildlife Foundation, Greening Australia and Hilton International Hotels Group, Ricky studied at Hong Kong Polytechnic, Melbourne Business School and University of Victoria holding various degrees in marketing, tourism, business and plastic manufacturing. So it's great to have someone on who's actually dealing with the problem, not just observing it. So thanks very much for joining us today, Ricky. Before we charge into the webinar, just a bit of administration. So for questions, and you know we love our Q&A section of these webinars, please use that Q&A button and type your questions in there and we will do our best to answer them in this session. I'd suggest lodge them early because the last few sessions we've had, uh, had to go considerably over time and some of those people at the end of the lists didn't get their questions answered. So I encourage you to put those questions up early. Why does HydroTerra undertake these webinars? Well, we're keen to share knowledge of people who have a similar passion to ourselves about environmental monitoring and also environmental management. We see ourselves helping to facilitate education and we like to take a bit of a leadership position helping to raise awareness of organisations like the one today. All right, now the actual program for today. Ricky's going to talk to us about the story of plastic. She's actually going to start with a short video about the problems of plastic in the ocean. And uh, just bear with us as we share screens. There could be a couple of technical challenges there. Uh, so there'll be a short video there. And then we're going to talk about the story of plastic. What is plastic? The good, the bad, the ugly. Current efforts and initiatives, particularly around recycling, plastic bans, and the circular economy. Then we're going to have a bit of a look at food waste and plastic packaging including the national packaging targets, progress and packaging innovation. And then we're going to have a bit of a look at Ricky's organisation and the various programs that they're working on. So without further ado, I will hand over to Ricky and we will share this short video. Open flowers in the windy fields of this war torn world. Our love of the ocean goes back eons. Our love of plastic, just decades. 
Whilst the ocean gave us the gift of life, we turned our backs and treated it with neglect. Today, our love affair with plastic is everywhere to see. But the consequences of our addiction are largely unknown. The Plastic Oceans Foundation has commissioned free diver Tanya Streeter and documentary filmmaker Craig Leeson to investigate plastic pollution in the world's oceans. This film reveals their shocking discoveries. Plastic is indestructible. We are now producing nearly 300 million tons every year, more than the combined weight of all the adult humans on the planet. Half of this plastic we use just once and throw away. We've treated the ocean as a place to dispose of things that we did not want close to where we thought we lived. Actually, the whole planet is where we live. Plastic is a blessing, but it's also a curse. It doesn't go away. It just stays and stays for decades, even centuries. Our explorers begin their quest by joining key scientific expeditions around the world. They learn how plastic causes internal damage to marine life, agonizing and often fatal. Although indestructible, plastic breaks down into smaller and smaller pieces. When mixed with plankton, the base of the food chain, it is consumed in ignorance. Every surface trawl contains plastic, and at the centers of the oceans, this plastic outnumbers plankton. While nearly half of plastic floats, the rest sinks. So what deadly threats are found lurking in the depths? What I'm interested in is when we arbitrarily plop ourselves on a flat bottom in the middle of the med, is there anything but an abyssal plane? Are we going to see bottles, plastic, cans, you know, big containers of God knows what? I don't know. Mike prepares for a deep dive off the French port of Marseille. We came upon a pretty flat abyssal plain, very silty, very flat. And now we're starting bottle. to see a plastic bottle, exactly. We're now starting to see more and more plastic. We know so little about the deep ocean and the creatures that live there. But scientists now believe no part of its domain is untouched by the scourge of plastic. Plastic in the deep might be out of sight, out of mind, but pieces of plastic on the surface are far too tempting to ignore. Seabirds are the canaries of our oceans and the first indicators of the ocean's health. The shearwater birds that breed here on Lord Howe Island, a World Heritage Site, are in dire trouble. Seabird biologist Dr. Jennifer Lavers has dedicated her life to study them, and every visit to the island brings more and more alarming revelations. We collected something like 10 dead birds that morning. It was extremely depressing. Oh, look at that. Absolutely no doubt this bird died Stuffed as a result of that plastic. That is literally a gut full of plastic. It's quite alarming, isn't it? Oh, the stomach's just filled with it. Big pieces, too. Unbelievable. That plastic, when we weighed it out, accounted for 15% of that bird's body mass. If we translate that into human terms, that would be equivalent to you and I having somewhere around six or eight kilos of plastic inside of your stomach. But it's not only wildlife that's affected. Developing countries have few or no facilities to deal with plastic waste. Much of the population is forced to live among the debris of their daily lives. How much waste 
plastic waste is put into the waterways here? Do, do you have any idea? Uh, around 1,500 tons daily. 1,500 tons every day? Yes. Do you all live here? Yeah. So what do you do during Night the day? Uh, scavenger work. Scavenger? Yeah. yeah? What do you scavenge for? Plastic. Ah, and what do you do with the plastic? Go to the... Yeah? Yeah. And what do they give you for the plastic? Money. Money? Yeah. Our throwaway lifestyles are on the increase. Are these scenes an indication of what the future might hold for all of us? By the year 2050, as global populations increase, plastic production is expected to double, even triple. The frightening truth is no one even dares predict the numbers. In Germany, all packaging has been recovered since 1991. This voluntary initiative, the Green Dot System, eliminates plastic waste from the environment and nothing goes to landfill. Many countries in Europe now have progressive recycling schemes. Customers receive cash back on returned bottles and the bottles are automatically sorted into their materials of origin. Plastic is then converted back into pre-production pallets to make new plastic products. When plastic reaches the ocean, the problem is more than just waste. And this is the most insidious and terrifying discovery of all. In water, plastic attracts toxins like a magnet. When marine creatures consume the plastic, the toxins are released and stored in their fatty tissues. As these toxins travel up the food chain, they become concentrated in the fish we eat. When that happens, human health is at risk. Latest science has proved that toxins associated with plastics trigger all manner of critical disease. What do you do? You can't possibly filter out these tiny particles from the entire ocean. You can't filter the entire ocean. In fact, so much plastic is in the ocean now in a form that we really can't get to it that I feel the emphasis needs to immediately shift toward stop putting it in. The plastic ocean poses a double threat. Widespread polluted waste and unseen danger to the health of billions of people on this planet. Although we've come to love plastics in our daily lives, our connection to our first love, the ocean, is older and more vital. The Plastic Oceans documentary is a way to inspire people, first of all, to understand. With knowing comes caring. You might not care even if you know, but you can't care if you don't know. Back over to you, Ricky. Thanks so much, Richard. And um, before uh, we start, I just thought it would be um, uh, a good idea if we, um, for me, on behalf of the team and Plastic Oceans, we acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land and the sea and the country, and we pay our respects to their elders past and present. We acknowledge that the land and sea was and always will be Aboriginal land and sea. So thanks, Richard. Um, so just before we start, I wanted to just mention uh, to our um, guests and listeners today that the information on that video, um, which we started showing five years ago, the only information about this video that is out of date is the numbers and the tonnage that was said in the eight minute short of our one hour, 40 minute video. And it said 300, it said 300 million. It's actually now 400 million. It said um, 8 million. It's now 11 million. So just to show you in the five years since we made this film, the plastic increase in the ocean and in the world globally is going up. And that's what we'll be talking about. And this is what you can see with the, with the graph here of global plastic production. So, you know, I know a lot of you are very um, learned and know a lot about plastics already. I know that you had a fantastic presentation that 
happened a few weeks ago about soil and microplastics. And I'll be talking about that obviously a bit later on. But what I wanted to really show and, and, and go through very, fairly quickly is actually the history of plastic and show why we are where we are today. And um, you can see with the dot points I've got on here, I, I did um, have that correction for you about 400 million metric tonnes. So today is not about doom and gloom. Today is about facts and figures and actually what we can do to solve and help change things. And there is time to change things. So on that note, um, if you could change the slide, please, Richard, that'd be fantastic. So plastic in the ocean. So obviously we've talked a little bit about, about that already. I've done those numbers for you. Uh, you saw on the video there that we had um, a seal that had a, a piece of twine around its neck. And at the end of the film, we show how it's released. And luckily it was one of those ones that got away. But we are constantly finding that those stories are fewer and not so, not so prevalent that they do get away. Our job is to really try and change and hasten what is going on. And as I said, you've, you've probably all seen a lot of uh, doom and gloom already and you've seen many films. The film is great because it's visual and by seeing visually what's happening and you saw about the birds and the amount of plastic um, in their stomachs and there was um, just this week there was another research piece about the um, the microplastics when they break up really, really into small pieces, because they're irregular sizes, the actual plastic, when it's consumed by the bird, it's not only that it's consumed it and it can't eat anymore because its stomach gets full of the plastic, but the, the edges of the plastic shrubs are sharp. So it's actually also damaging the birds as it goes in and, and actually ripping and destroying their um, uh, organs and things. Uh, as it goes down. So this is new research that came out just this week. Everything that I talk about today, I'm really happy to send through information and links to the references of the new information because literally there's three or four things I'm going to mention today that have come out just in since Monday. So obviously I didn't get to put it onto this presentation. Um, next slide, please. So that was our film, which we saw. And you go to the next one. So the story of plastic, um, it's a small, um, it, there's a lot of information on here and it's a small slide, but I wanted to just draw your attention to the fact that um, if you go down to the third column down middle section where you can see the old fashioned telephone, I don't know if um, people can see that. So that is the one that's probably the most important one in that um, as was um, mentioned in the notes, um, one of the reasons that plastic actually started in the first place was that people in their, uh, humans in their cleverness, were trying to see what we could do to stop um, the ivory trade. And they looked at how could we substitute a product that is like ivory, hard, you know, durable, um, you know, last forever, basically. And at that time, I suppose they thought it was um, affordable, sadly. Uh, and that was actually the pre precipice of which um, the, the story of plastic began. And it wasn't until 19, basically 1909, where the Bakelite product came to light and it was used then as the, for the telephone. A lot of people don't actually know that story. Um, and what is sad is that we're very clever, but we weren't very smart because we were clever to create something that we could never get rid of because it's so wonderfully indestructible, it's so wonderfully flexible, it's so wonderfully cheap, it's so wonderfully all these amazing properties that the problem is that we have now is that we didn't look at the end of life of a product that was being made way back then. Understandably, think about 1909, what was happening in the world then, very different space to where we are now. People were just thinking, isn't it great, you know, what we did then. And, and then from there, it just escalated. And you look at 1926, 1941 with polyethylene, which, of course, the dreaded water bottle, that's where the dreaded water bottle landed with us. Um, and you keep going through, you've got the poly, you got polyethylene with the plastic bag in the 1950s. And so it goes on. And it's just become more sophisticated um, you know, more additives, more um, uh, stabilizers are included. 
and the 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 amount of plastic that is new plastic that's being produced and manufactured hasn't decreased at all. It's escalating out of control. So even with all the information that we do know, we're not slowing down production, which is one of the things that I'll, I'll talk about a little bit later. So next slide, please. So what's plastic made of? Well, obviously, most of you will know that the raw material is from oil. So the majority of plastic comes out of oil and a lot of people are saying, well, you know, um, if we stop using petrol and we change over to uh, electric cars, isn't that great? But actually it's not. The, the um, oil refinery companies love that plastic is made as a byproduct, which they're now looking, you know, it's been, it's been at the forefront as another way for them to sell oil. So when you look at crude oil and what it's made of um, and how that translates into the pellets, uh, it's quite uh, disturbing. So we look at um, synthetic uh, pellets. We look at what, what's happening with that. And I'm going to just quickly run you through, um, uh, again, next slide, please, um, the start of that and why does it matter. Again, we've got that little chart. Next slide, please which I've shown you there, and we can run through this a bit faster if you like. Um, and we go to the next slide, which is I'm going to talk about um, the, good, the good side of plastic. So as I said, it's not all doom and gloom. There's been some wonderful, amazing things that have come from plastic, which has been terrific, obviously helping human health. Um, it's been for packaging and um, made it um, safe, hygienic, um, protected, can you know the life the lifespan of pills, medicine, all these things obviously last way way longer, which is fantastic. Um, I won't go to bed. I'm just going to talk about the good food. Obviously, food. Well, food lasts way longer. You walk down the supermarket aisle, and what do you see? Thousands of products are vacuum packed, particularly meat. All the you know meat, dairy, all those sorts of products that are the, that are the ones that will usually go off in a couple of days. The whole supply chain of food changed when we started doing the plastic packaging. So that was great because it meant that farmers, it meant that the, that everybody was able to um, sell more. Uh, it was packaged for longer. It was able to be freezable, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, that was a really good thing and it meant that people, and, and it really has helped um, with poverty, uh, places where poverty is rife that you could send send food over like, and it lasts a lot longer. Like there's, there's numerous reasons why the food side of it has just absolutely been amazing. Um, and that's great. That is great. However, I'll talk more about that afterwards. Um, electronics. So again, everybody uses mobile phones. Everybody has, it's, if we, we've done it at Pet Plastic Oceans Australasia, we've done lots of little fun things with our, with our um, followers and one of the things that we did was we challenged people to go one day without using anything that was made of plastic whether it be soft plastic or hard plastic and of course that included da -da, mobile phone plastic 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 and nobody could do it it was very difficult for people to to actually go the whole day even getting in your car cars got hard plastic the inside of the car seat and the doors, and you look at all the plastic products that are in your car, which follows onto the comfort point. It's it's enormous, and people, a lot of people, a lot of us just don't realise that our lives are absorbed with plastic, which has made it comfortable. Um, you know, IT technology, consumption of food, and then of course health. So those are the good things. And imagine for all of you out there, if you use contact lenses, for example, contact lenses made of plastic. So, yes, you could wear your glasses, but some people, you know, uh, it's not great for them to wear glasses and they use contacts. So I'm just using that or invisible stitches for the doctors. And, you know, we, we talk about all the different things. If I started down the health, the health hospital side of things, we wouldn't get off this subject. So I'll move to the next slide, please, and talk and we'll keep moving. But it's definitely some fabulous things. And those good things, obviously there's going to be things that we will continue to use, products, that we will continue to use forever that are made of plastic. So plastic's never going to go away. We know that. And at our organisation, we're definitely not plastic 
haters. We know that there's good things about plastic, but unfortunately there's some very bad things about plastic. And I already mentioned before about the fossil fuel and where it comes from, and obviously this is a really bad thing because it never goes away. And once it's been produced and made into a product, that's where the challenges become absolutely escalate because then we go into the whole breakdown of what what happens with the end of life and I'll talk a lot more about this when we get on to the um, example that I'm going to focus on which is about food and plastic packaging so with garbage obviously um, it's landfill it's enormous the majority of what ends up in the ocean the waterways and the ocean is actually from landfill a lot of people don't actually connect land to the sea, but it's absolutely 86% of what is in landfill is what goes into the ocean, that ends up in the ocean. So we really have to be mindful of of this issue. And even if it's tied down and not able to blow away and get washed into storm drains, even if it just stays, if it's lucky, in the landfill site, it breaks down and there's toxins that are in those Uh, plastics which actually leach then into the soil and you had a a whole conversation about that with um with your previous um webinar so I don't need to go into that you've already heard all about the soil soil part of it but those uh, toxins are, are rife and that's a very big problem as well so our garbage is an issue and of course we have a whole big piece of work that's being done about um, sorting our rubbish putting it into the right bins where is it going to go what uh, how do, a lot of us still don't know how to sort what to sort to and what to do and again just today uh yesterday sorry uh there was another announcement from Tanya Plibersek about how, having a look at how they can um restart the red cycle concept again and what can, can Aldi Coles and Woolies do and I'll, again I'll talk a bit more about that but as I was saying to you, things are, we're trying really hard to move along to have some wins with the bad side of it, but it is a super humongous challenge, not just environmentally, but also because it, it directly uh, contributes to climate change. And then, of course, marine life. So we you can see by the picture that we've got on the screen uh, with the seal there, that's just the tip of the iceberg so to speak of the damage and what we're doing and we talked you saw about the birds in the film the short film that you've seen um you also saw about fish and the microplastics that are in fish that we eat so it's just it is a massive issue and we really really need to um address which we haven't really been doing um next slide please so the ugly um, well, I sort of, I suppose, have given away a bit of it and you've already got a bit of an idea about that anyway because that's what you've been, uh, you know, I had the chat about the microplastics. Um, and I'm just going to read, I'm just going to read something uh, to you that actually landed in my inbox today from someone who um, I work closely with and I'm just going to read this to you straight hot off the press, as they say. More than 170 trillion plastic particles found in the ocean as pollution reaches unprecedented levels. So this is literally today. The world's oceans are polluted by plastic smog made up of an estimated 171 trillion plastics, and they would weigh approximately 2.3 million tonnes, according to this new study that took spanned over from 1979 to 2019, from nearly 12,000 sampling points in the Atlantic, Pacific, and the Indian Oceans and the Mediterranean Sea. They found a rapid, international science found a rapid and unprecedented increase in the ocean plastic pollution since since 2005. And this study that's published um, in the journal PLOS One, P. LOS1, which I'll find for you and and we'll get it out there if people are interested. Um, The previous studies, um, and this actually has come, it's much higher than previously estimated. um, And this is from the Five Guys Institute um, Executive Director, Lisa Erdi. Uh, It's way, way more. And she was reporting to um, CNN about this. So this is just to give you 
the information about how this has soared in the last um, couple of decades with the single-use plastics, our waste management systems, we're not keeping in pace. And as you know, only about 9% of um, global plastics um, are, re are even recycled each year. So uh, we, we, we have so much to do. So microplastics are the absolute insidious worst part of the whole plastic cycle, like absolutely the worst part. Um, and it's something that I really want people to take on board. You had that whole story about microplastics and soil, but I'm just reinforcing that and letting you know that. Microplastics, of course, affect human health. You saw about fish, um, the consumption of fish. Microplastics um, sit in the fatty tissues. We're currently, so in pla at Plastic Oceans, we um, have three areas in our business, and one is science and research. And we've got a, a research project happening right now as we speak with Macquarie University um, and um, UTS, uh, which is actually, um, we're actually at the pointy end of the study, which is counting and looking at all those different shapes. Um, I was talking about shapes of plastic before, the microplastics, and we're counting and looking at all the different microplastics that we found in two um, commercially eaten fish in Sydney Harbour. And that this study, when this is completed, is going to be really interesting for us and for the world because although there has been a lot of study done about microplastics in fish and other um, animals, um, this is going to be one of the um, most up-to-date ones that we've got in our waters for Australasia, which is relevant for us where we're living. So um, watch this space on that. But we know that um, plastics... Plastic is carcinogenic. We know that it's not good for us. We know the toxins are not good. Um, the, uh, the estimate is that on average we absorb, whether it's through, through air or whether it's through eating products or other ways, that we are absorbing the equivalent of one credit card full of plastic each person per year. Now, you might think, some of you might say, oh, that's not a lot, and, that, and some of you might be, like, overwhelmed with that. I think it's terrible for any, any um, organism to be absorbing plastic in any way, shape, or form because you can't get rid of it. This is the issue. It's, it's out of People feel out of sight, out of mind, don't see it, it's all fine. It's actually not. It sits with us forever. Um, so COVID-19 actually exacerbated the situation uh, globally. Uh, we were going really well. We were sort of, you know, three steps forward. And then with COVID, if there was all this publicity out there. Oh, you mustn't use plastic bags. You mustn't use plastic cups. You mustn't do the, sorry, you mustn't use your reusable cups. You mustn't use your cloth, cloth bags. You've got to go back and use your plastic. So um, the psychology of that for people was, oh, okay, I'll just go back and do my old things when I was doing it. It was so much easier, so much more convenient. And we went backwards with the whole um, uh, footprint of moving forward positively about getting people to change what they were doing due to COVID, the, the increase in masks, the increase in gloves, and, of course, gowns and everything that's been used. And it still is, it, we increased 33%. There was a 33% globally in single-use plastic over the two years, last two years. So we, as you could probably expect, were busier than ever because of what was happening with the plastic increase during those couple of years. So it's not great. Um, it's really, really slowed down progress. And as I said, um, smart, not clever, clever, not smart, depends which way you want to put it. But either way, we're not really, we're not really that smart as a um, species because we were too smart. We were clever to make something but we weren't really that smart to, um, to work out the end of life. So next slide, please. So current efforts are not enough. Um, there's so much going on here that it, um, where do I begin? I'm going to go fast because we want to get to questions. Oh, that's the best part, right, Richard? We love questions. <laughs> recycling. So recycling versus circular economy. I'll talk about that. By, so I've talked about recycling. We only recycle about 9%, which is absolutely um, minimal to what we need to do. 
Recycling is not the silver bullet. Everybody talks about, oh, yeah, well, if I put it in my bin or it goes to recycle, that's great. It's actually not. Recycling for us is the last frontier. It's the absolutely last place you want it to end up. So we talk a lot about avoiding it at the source and doing things differently. Biodegradable and compostable, another, that's a whole big story. Uh, we could do a whole session just on biodegradable and compostable, but may I just say that biodegradable and compostable are not the way out of this situation because biodegradable products and compostable products all need to be treated as well and they need to be disposed of in a different way to what goes in your recycling bin to landfill for them to actually make a difference. And, again, a lot of people are very confused about the... Um, the systems and what happens for to recycle something and for something to be compostable um, and biodegradable. So if you truly want to do a composting, do it in your backyard and, yes, and turn it over and make sure you've got the right temperature and you've got the right amount of water and you can actually manage it, you might get that product that might say that it's going to break down in 180 days. If you do it in, if you're in control, great, buy it, use it, put it in your backyard. But the rest of it that goes into your bin, not a chance, not a chance until we get some commercial compostable, millions more commercial compostable centres that can actually deal with the compostable because it needs to be treated differently. Big corporations have a lot to answer for um, in the sense that they can do so much more. They can be doing a lot more internally with their staff internally with procurement, internally with being leaders and making change with um, SMEs. Um, there's so much more that can be done with big corporations, including the oil companies, may I say. So there is so much there that is not enough. And plastic bands. So the plastic bands are great. Please don't get me wrong. We are absolutely delighted that the states in Australia are rolling out their plastic bands. Unfortunately, and that there is a slide on this um, in a minute that I'll talk about, it's just not enough. And with that, can we go to the next slide, please? So with this, um, our problematic and unnecessary plastic products by 2025. Now, the products that are out there that have been banned, and if you go to the next slide, please. So again, it's a little, a little small, but hopefully you can see it reasonably well. And this is available on many websites. Um, this is, the, yeah, there's, there's many websites that you can look at, particularly the government websites. But if you look at the top of the chart and it says um, the, the names of our different states and you look at the ticks, or the green ticks are what have been banned, the blue ticks are what's not been, uh, it, bans not yet commenced, and um, the orange are subject to consultation. Now, interestingly, I just want to draw your attention to the fact that um, in the orange one, which is um, uh, falls under plates and balls in SA, and then you look under microbeads, um, which is in ACT, that's this year, which is going to be really interesting to see because they're the first state uh, nationally that are going to be um, tackling microbeads, apropos microplastics, nanoplastics, microfibers, all the things that I've been mentioning before. Um, and that's going to be really interesting. So that's under consultation. They're proposing to do that. So it'll be interesting to see where that goes and what happens there. But if you look at Northern Territory, um, the only product in NT that has actually been banned is the plastic bag. That's the only one. And all that's all. And they've got a major problem there. We do some work in the NT with schools and businesses and some of the remote regional Indigenous communities, et cetera. And it's a massive problem because a lot of the plastic that they get is actually not all from them. It actually comes down from Indonesia and the Philippines and comes down onto the shores. So they've got the most amazing beaches, beautiful. A thousand, they've got thousands of kilometres of the most pristine beaches in NT, but a lot of it is is um, is they're challenged because it actually doesn't even come from their own production, but what's coming from overseas. That's another story, but just to show that with you. So there's a lot of work to be done. So the plastic bands, why did I say it's not enough? It's not enough because we're only highlighting half a dozen to 12 items. There's thousands of single-use plastic items that we use every day 
in our daily lives that are what I call high volume products that we could eliminate a lot of those. We don't need those. They're not essential to our daily life and we could be using something else. So that's why that was in that category under why aren't we doing that, you know, why isn't it enough? There are current initiatives, which are great. Um, Old fashioned to me, back in the day, South Australia, I don't know whether you remember, but, you know, many decades ago, South Australia was already the ones that were doing the container deposit scheme with the cans, the bottles, et cetera, et cetera. Now people talk about the container deposit schemes as, as, it's, as if it's this new thing. It's not. It's not a new thing. It's just that we're saying, oh, well, okay, that works. That's a way to get people to change their behaviour. So we work closely with the container deposit scheme, for example, in Queensland, um, and we're delivering to schools, um, about 300 schools. We're delivering our schools program, which tells them and talks about the PET bottle and how it's great to recycle and you get some money. The reason it's working, again, going right round the loop, is because people are getting 10 cents back. And those 10 cents do, do add up and, it, and it's great. At least it's not going directly to landfill. It's got a chance for it to be recycled and go back into the system. So that's, that's an initiative which is great. Um, it's going to be um, the, Victoria starting up, um, Tasmania starting up, WA started up a couple of years ago. So that's great. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a way to help change people's behaviour. And it's a, it's a way to try and stop it from getting into the ocean. So it's great. Then we've got the product stewardship extended producer responsibility. And this is basically saying when um, a company makes a product, sell it like a Pepsi Coke or whatever bottle, they should actually be looking at the end of life of that product and adding um, an additional fee onto that so that they take responsibility that when that ends up in the bin or before it ends up in the bin, that they're doing something about it to make sure that it's, re it's reused or, or used responsibly. So that's not a bad, that's not a bad thing. That's, that's, that's great. There's more, you know, there's a lot more being looked at with that, which is really good. But um, I, I guess it brings me to my next point, which is talking about circular economy, um, which is the next slide. If you can go to the next slide, please. And a lot of you will be very familiar with this. And there's a lot of confusion, even more confusion. Confusion reigns. Confucius says, confusion reigns. Oh, sorry, it is Friday. I've got to just, you know, bear with me. Um, the circular economy um, is a wonderful way to raise awareness, to move people more into a sustainable life cycle. What is the difference? The difference between recycling and the circular economy is that we are looking more holistically at the, at the life cycle of a particular product and looking how it can be more sustainably you, uh, created, used and disposed of to keep it in the system. So I'll give you an example. If you think about um, glass, so glass can be recycled. 86, I think it's 80... I think it's 85% of glass can consistently be recycled forever and reused and stay in the circle and it will never end up in landfill as such. Um, and the reason that is, is it's a pretty pure product. It's got, it's it's easy, It's it doesn't get mixed and mingled with all the different, like, for example, with plastic properties. So glass is a really good one. Metal is actually really good as well. A lot of people don't think about metal, but metal is a really pure and really good product as well in staying in the system for a circular economy. People often think that plastic is the easy one. Plastic's not. It's, plastic is really hard, as we know. So with the circular economy, it's really looking at that longevity of the production of a product going into the system and how it then gets reused, recycled, and never going out to the final destination with landfill. So um, I, I'm happy um, and I know that there'll probably be quite a bit of discussion uh, maybe on that. If there isn't, that's okay. I'm just uh, very aware of that. I'm going to talk on another chart in a moment, which is about the packaging, which is a good example. Um, so I'll move on if I could to the next slide, please. So I wanted to delve down a bit closer into food waste and plastic packaging. And I thought this might be useful for yourselves um, to know because not only does it affect your day-to-day -day life, but it's a good example of what I'm talking about with um, circular economy, um, social responsibility, environmental responsibility, 
and economic responsibility. So there's some numbers there. 3.4% um, of global emissions are created through um, plastic packaging, uh, which is 10% of global emissions. It's quite a, quite a lot for people to think about, excuse me, and take in. Um, 3.4, sorry, 3.46 million tonnes of plastic consumed annually. 1 million tonnes estimated to be single use and 13.1% of plastic is recovered. So that's the, those figures, are recent figures. This is figures specifically for packaging. And I gave you figures before, which was the total, um, which includes not just plastic packaging, but plastic generally. Um, 7.6 million tonnes of food weight is wasted annually. And they've got some wonderful organisations that are doing great jobs with trying to stop that waste, as you know, like Second Bite, um, Oz Harvest, et cetera, they're doing really great jobs with that. Um, and 70%, sadly, of that food is perfectly edible, not just for humans. If it's not okay for humans, it can be used for other, um, other animals that can eat those vegetables, et cetera, even if they're a few days old. Um, and... Um, yeah, and uh, mo and the, the the amount of the plastic recovered, the majority of that is actually from households. So, just wanted to give you a little bit of some stats on that. Um, next slide, please. So, I showed you a slide before, which was talking about the mandates for um, the different states and products that they've put mandates on to phase out. And this is the twenty twenty five national packaging targets. So. Um, APCO is um, a very well-known organisation, which is the Australian Packaging Covenant Organisation, and they work with many, many, many manufacturing companies of food in particular, uh, all, all products, not just food, but food's a big high, high one of it. And you can get some fantastic stats on their website. And again, that's something that we can send, I can send you through a link, but it'll be easy for you to find. Um, in fact, one of our board members is actually um, ex, uh, the sustain, ex sustainability um, director from APCO, and so we we have have conversations all the time and updates about what's going on. So if you look at the targets here, and I don't know how well um, you can see the the chart here, but we you know if you start with the raw material on the top left, where it's a light coloured sort of mauvey purple, and you follow that um, chart around with uh, packaging production, packaging and filling, and you look at the use, source, separation, collection, uh, sorting, cleaning, secondary material production, um, end market, and then that's your cycle of the, the value, the, the plastic value chain. So the reason I wanted to show you this is that, um, as it says on the left-hand side, 100% of our reusable recycle, 100% of the, of the materials with the plastic um, packaging targets there is they want to basically look at that 100% is, is um, by 2025, 100% is either reusable, recyclable or compostable. Well, um, I, I don't like to be doom and gloom, but I don't think that's, I don't think we're anywhere, I don't think we're going to reach those targets. I think it's going to be very, very difficult. Um, we've got 70% of plastic packaging being recycled or composted. Um, I don't know whether that's going to happen. Um, we're trying. We'll see. And then 50% average recycled content included in packaging, um, and that was revised from the 30% in 2020. Now, we were struggling just to get to 30%, and we've upped it to um, 50%. So I don't know. Based on the current trajectory of what people are not doing and organisations are not doing and what governments are not doing, I have no idea how we're going to reach these targets. It would be wonderful, but I really have no idea how we're going to get there. So if we go to the next slide, it'll show you actually how we're progressing um, with what I've been saying. Just before we do, Ricky, the 100%, you mentioned earlier about you, you had some reservations about compostable packaging um, and biodegradable products as well. So do you think that's a sensible packaging target to be aiming for or should it not be on there at all? The I, I don't, well, if you, if the next slide it shows the results of what's been happening in the last, um, if you look at that top one, it shows what's been happening there with the results from 2017, 2018, and you can actually see that it's actually dropped down to 86%. So, and so we're going down with the tar projected targets, not up. 
So it was 88, 89 and 86. And that's, that's, that's a lot of that is about the fact that we haven't got the mechanisms in place so that those compostable, um, the, comp the items that are made out of compostable items like corn um, cornstarch or sugarcane, et cetera, they're not being disposed of in a way that they can actually be composted. And we need to do more infrastructure um, as, as, a, as a society to allow for that to happen. So I think it's a bit out of people's, the ha general household people, you and me, or all of us, we live in a house somewhere or we live, we have a place where we live. It's very hard for us to do the right thing when there isn't the, the um, facilities available to do, to actually give it the end of life that it needs. So when you look at that target, I, I just see it as being quite unrealistic and I think there needs to be a lot of work on that. And that's for the reusable, recyclable. Um, and then you look at the 70% of plastic packaging, you can see the results there. So it's pretty static, 16, 18, 16. Um, 50%, um, the 50% has gone up. That's the only one that has increased 50% of recycled content included in packaging. So what's that, what that is meaning is that when um, a manufacturer is looking at a new product, he or she are working on how they can include more recycled content into the injection molding or the blow filming or whatever it is that they're going to be doing with it, making that product. So it's in development stage, just fell development phase. That was 2019, 2020. So I'm hoping that we'll get some more up-to-date figures on that, but that's all I've got at the moment. But basically what it's showing you is that we're not moving forward very fast, which is what I'm saying. You know, where, how are we progressing? Very slowly, very slowly. So if you look at material recyclability as well and you look at the bottom there, what's good, what's limited, things that are not recyclable, um, so you've got paper and paper and um, paperboard, um, not bad. Glass, as I mentioned to you, glass is glass is fantastic. Glass is the one that is the winner. Um, plastic, sixty percent. Uh, metal, ninety-seven percent. I mentioned metal as well as you know that one's also really good. And then wood. Um, interestingly, you'd think with wood that you would have a better uptake. But um, it's not always the case, and that's a, lo a lot of that also can be to do with the process um, of how it's been recycled as well. So um, recycled content, the third chart on the bottom right there, um, looking at average in all packaging, giving you percentages, and this is just to really back up what we're talking about, but it's broken it down into the property types. So you've got PET, HDPE, paper packaging, metal, glass, et cetera. So you can see um, the target, the green is the target and the blue is actually, actually what was reached. So if you look at paper packaging was the closest one with 54% and the uh, paper packaging target was 60%. Um, and look at plastics, plastics packaging, pretty dismal. Three, the target was 20% and it only got 3%. So there's lots, look, there's a lot of data, there's a lot of charts, it can get very confusing. You can, and, you know, as I said, I don't want this to be doom and gloom. It's just to showcase that we're really not progressing. There's a lot of my, I don't call it greenwash. For me and our team, we call it greywash. There's a lot of greywashing out there about all these wonderful things that are happening, but it's not happening fast enough. And I still don't think that we really get, get, the issues. I really think that there's still some mindset changes that need to happen. Um, so where do we go from here? Next slide, please. I don't know how we're going for time, but hopefully. Um, if you've got a few minutes left. We'll, we'll jump straight to questions after this one, maybe. Yeah, we might just need to rush through. I'll just click through really quickly. So um, reduce packaging, design better packaging, simplify recycling, educate and empower and consumers. Um, next slide, please. Obviously, reduce packaging, so no brainer. Uh, it's so ridiculous to have veg vegetables and fruit. I've seen bananas that are shrink wrapped, like and and oranges. That, um, anyway, I won't go there, but it's just sickening. Next slide, please. Design of better packaging. So obviously, that's a really important thing, and that's what is being looked at already now. There is a lot of work being done. 
Nestle, um, Kellogg's, um, Cadbury, like they are all looking at Madeira, they're all looking at what they're, Moderna, they're all looking at what they're doing, but it's it's got a long way to go, as we've already talked about. So next slide, please. Uh, simplify recycling. Yep, that would be really great. That would be a really good thing to do is, um, you know, check it before you chuck it. A lot of people still don't do that. Um, I, I see that all the time. Uh, next slide, please. So our work, this is important, I guess, for you to know that there's hope and solutions. And this is what I wanted to show you that uh, we're not alone, but this is some of the things that we do to really try and hasten and speed things up. We do a lot of work in policy advocacy and we work with the governments at the top, putting forward um, submissions. We're on the International Plastic Treaty, really trying to make that change and getting people to really think about what's happening government level wise. And then we also work from the bottom up. So we work in um, business, sustainability, education, science, research. Um, next slide, please. And it's split into three areas and they're all intertwined and segued together. There's no silos. Everything is mixed together. The science and research helps the education. Education helps business sustainability and vice versa. Uh, next slide, please. So we've, this is our little circular economy chart and our little how we walk the talk. And it's just to show you what we do within our organisation. The number one thing is to create systemic change. Um, how do we do that? With technology and innovation, help create pioneering practices, bring others on the journey, diagnose the system, walk the talk. So that's an ongoing cycle, like the packaging cycle that you saw and like the circular economy one. Next slide, please. Just before we do, Ricky, so if people want to work with you, do you offer a consultancy service for them to? Absolutely. And I'll talk about that in a minute. I'll just get, yeah, absolutely. But what I did want to show you is as a big takeaway for everybody today, regardless of anything, if you would like to have a go at trying to have a picnic without plastic and you'd like to be environmentally friendly, in September every year, we have this campaign where you host or have a picnic or join a picnic with friends and you can actually have a go and see how you go with it. Take a photo, enter one of the many categories of our competition and um, can, apart from winning great prizes, it's a really good way for people to do things differently. We give you recipes of making products that you don't have to buy in the supermarket. We give you lots and lots of hot tips, great chefs we've got out there. Uh, and we talk about how easy it is. So the picnic is just sort of the carrot. You think about any time, whether you're going camping, whether you're going to, um, you know, a music festival, it doesn't matter where you're going, wherever you go, whenever you go outside and you want to take food and refreshments with you, this is a way to really help this. This is our community, community behaviour change piece that anybody can do. So I'm really, there's a website address there and it's free, of course, everything's free because we just want people to take it up and do it. Um, next slide, please. And it tied that ties in beautifully about all the whole food packaging example. But for consultants and for maybe some of the um, wonderful people that are here today, we have a program which is a fee for service, like a consultancy package that we offer called Epic. And it, we had Epic before COVID, by the way. And I know today the word Epic has become the Epic word to use for everything, but it actually means engagement in plastic-free innovation for change. We're very much about changing people's behaviour with solutions um, through um, uh, innovative technology that we have. We've, we're even now looking at how we can measure your carbon footprint of the plastic that you didn't use. So we provide a program which actually goes over 12 months and you can use it internally with your staff or with your suppliers or with your contractors or with anybody really. Uh, to actually create your own circular economy within your organisation to show you're making a change. And if lots more people could do this, we've done a lot with councils, a lot with businesses, schools, communities, et cetera, if a lot more people could take up this model, maybe we could then give it to the government and say this is what everybody should be doing, helping with procurement, helping with your own policies within your organisation, et cetera, et cetera. So, again, really happy to share and give material out to people that are interested. So I hope that answered your question, Richard. It did. So you're trying to drive for, in the end, a standard 
that the government adopts? Is that really? Yeah. yeah. So from the bottom, from bottom up, top down, squeeze out the plastic in the middle. Think of a hamburger and plastics in the middle, and just trying <laughs> to sandwich it out. <laughs> But it, yeah, basically, um, we 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 we're trying to give people options. That actually, we've got some runs on the board. We're working in health, we're working in construction, retail, community, and actually got examples of all the things we're doing um, in this area with this program. And this was organically grown out of what we do with schools. So people kept on saying to us, "Oh, we really love what you're doing with the schools. Could you do this for big people?" So the Epic program has actually just. Not because we thought, oh, this is something we could sell. It's actually something that people have asked us for and there's a need for it. So you can get lots of prezos, you get lots of stuff off the shelf, but we really take people on a journey to empower that change. Um, do you want to go to the next slide, please? Yep, we're over time. so we. I know, it's nearly done. It's the next slide. I think we're just done. It's just, uh, you can just flip through this. Um, the next yep. one, I think we're done. This is just a little quote. Um, and then we were going to do takeaways and all that. So I'll leave it to you. Over to you, Richard. Thank you. Well, thanks very much, Ricky. I've got a couple of questions, but we'll go to the early bird questions. But before we do that, I guess the key takeaways here is that Ricky's giving us um, some hope that it's not too late. It's certainly also highlighted that it's a huge um, problem. I think that picture of that bird from Lord Howe Island uh, really brings it home pretty nicely, um, that it's just a massive problem and we need to get on with it. Um, takeaway number two, global manufacturing product design unification is needed. And takeaway number three, corporates need to take the lead to help drive change through ESG and CSR objectives. Look, I had another key takeaway, and I guess it's the first question. I get the chance to ask the first few questions, Ricky, is you had a statistic which was 86% of all the plastic that's in the ocean was plastic that was destined for landfill. Yes. So it's going to take a while for us to get all these other innovations in place, all those targets, the 100% recyclable, et cetera, et cetera. Could we not really focus in very hard on the waste collection through to landfill and actually depositing it in the landfill if that's where the leakage actually is? Could we not rapidly move to tightening the noose on just how we get the litter to the landfill, given that's where there's so much, you know, slippage, right? Mm. We need to buy well, home, well, you know, it's a good question. In Victoria, they've started with the um, the purple bins in some of the suburbs, which is to, to collect glass. So glass had its own um, sourcing um, uh, separation. The the other countries um, I've I've lived in and visited, like Canada, for example, they for many 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 years have had a very very um, more succinct. Um, separation system which has been was I think about even 20 years ago from memory far more advanced than what we've got here in Australia and I think the reason why Australia doesn't come up very well numbers wise is because we have a large land mass and we've got a very low population compared to many other countries in the world and I think that's why it's always showing up that Australia is one of the worst um, um, disposes of, of lack of disposing properly because of the numbers the numbers game um there is a lot there's a lot more that needs to be done and unfortunately it's not just about us putting it in the right bin and knowing what the plastic is or what the item is whether it be wood and there's some that are mixed up where you don't even know whether it's a wood a plastic or glass like you know it's it's so muddled up with the way it's been produced it's really about that taking it all the way back um, to the to the actual manufacturer. So I also am with the Society of Plastic Engineers and I'm talking with the engineers at the, at the beginning when they're looking at form and what they're going to make and why they're going to make it and how they're going to make it. And it's really that very beginning at the source of looking at how you can reduce what the end product's going to be. So produce the end extended producer responsibility part, I think is going to help. That's going to be one of the biggest ways is stopping it at the source so it doesn't even end up at your bin 
and then the bin doesn't have to go to landfill. All right, we better go to the early bird questions. Here we go. And thanks very much for those who did send in these early bird questions. Are there any programs that are presented to the schools regarding this issue? Yes, I've already mentioned that. We have a very comprehensive program that we deliver to schools and have done over the last five years. I think you mentioned the other day that uh, that gives you hope for the future because they're more aware than we were of the problem. Um, it certainly makes sense. Uh, number two, melting of ice caps is decreasing the salt concentration in the ocean. Could this, I can't read the next word, sorry. Um, Could this have an impact on waste plastics in the ocean? Yeah. Uh, yes, it could, um, but I don't know the exact um, chemical, um, biology, marine um, uh, percentage with all of that and that's something that I'd like to take away and get back to that person um, from the scientists in my team uh, but yes it could and obviously we're hearing a lot about the increase in the in the um, ice cap melting across or, you know they I think they just said again this week about the Antarctic uh, with the the um, the thickness of ice in the Antarctic had reached an all-time low again numbers on that I'll have to check but I'd like to take that on notice and I can get back to whoever that is with uh, more information, if that's okay. No worries. Now, this one's pretty open. What plastics can be recycled? Maybe is there a readily available list out there that people can... Yeah, so we've got we've got listings, um, you know, so there, you know there's numbers, the one to seven rating system that came out a long time ago and there is quite a lot of labelling which shows you when you buy a product whether it, whether it can actually be recycled or not. So the one to seven sourcing uh, of a product is the easiest one to look at. And there is quite a lot on a number of government reps, websites about that. If you're in Victoria, you could go to um, the um, Sustainability Victoria site. They've got a whole big piece on it there for Victoria uh, as well. And it's across, across the nation anyway, there's different sites. But if people um, don't have that handy uh, we've got that with our programs and what we do. It's too hard to explain now. It's very complicated. No, that's fine. Um, what we might do is we might shoot out an email to people with that list. Um, number four, microplastics, recovery, factors impacting rate of generation, food chain implications. So we covered that a bit. Mm. I at a high level. Um, I, I'm particularly interested in this uh, recovery of microplastics, like it's this... Uh, mm. so, um, so there's people out there that are doing some really good work in um, uh, re, um, uh, giving us data back of where microplastics are being found, and we've got a, a huge amount of information on that. But um, there is a couple of companies that have made some very interesting machinery that um, they go onto the beach and they can actually um, sift, literally sift through because you can't see them. And the nurdles look like when you see a nurdle, which is so, so tiny, it actually doesn't even look like plastic. For a lot of people, they don't even realise it's a microplastic. So nurdles on the beach, they almost look like um, sand, almost like sand grains. So um, it's actually um, quite hard to even identify it. And that's why birds and animal, other animals, marine animals, eat them because they look like what's, you know, natural. Um, but the, the and, and that's one of the factors with this question, um, that's one of the, the factors of how we can actually, like Mike said in, the, in our movie, it's almost impossible. Once it becomes a microplastic, it's almost impossible to actually stop that and, 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 and grab that micro, microplastic and stop it from going to anywhere else. And that's the problem with plastic is that it doesn't break down, it breaks up and eventually either ends up in the ocean or ends up as in, in the air. So it's um, the food chain implications are, are massive. And that's one of the things we want to do with this fish project that we're doing in Sydney Harbour is we're looking at, we want to look at the, um, the life cycle of the fish and about the reproduction of fish and about the size, growth size of fish because they're being affected, how they're being affected by the fact that they're consuming plastic. 
And what does that mean for the ongoing life cycle of the fish? So the implications are massive. Um, and just what I read out to you earlier on about the 171 trillion tonnes, I mean, that's really overwhelming from 1979 to 2019 was that research study. Um, and as I said, I only just got that literally today hot off the press from CNN. So there is so much the implications with microplastics is enormous. It's like it's a real problem. It, it'll be interesting to see how far we are through the, the cycle towards the peak, right? Because there's so much sitting on that ocean floor that you showed in the, the movie and so much uh, sitting there that's slowly degrading. It's not like we will have peaked in terms of microplastics, I would have thought. I think it's more to come. Um, sorry, meant to keep this one positive. <laughs> uh, next, I think we've covered question... Five. Five, but I was thinking more of six, sorry. What is the primary source of plastics? I think, so you said 86% from uh, packaging that would have gone to landfill, is that right? Yeah, well, yeah, most of the plastic in the oceans is actually single-use plastic, um, which is from landfill, and there's a small amount that comes from fishing, but nothing at all like what comes from landfill. Yeah. Or from the land, not just landfill, from the land, because it gets blown and carried. Right. It's material that yeah. would yeah. have been destined to yeah. go to land for one machine. Correct, yeah. 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 All right, we'll move. Uh, thanks very much to everyone who's still on the webinar. We'll move to the Q&A side of things. Have you got a couple more minutes, Ricky? Or? Yeah, I'll have to go by two if that's okay. I've got another meeting, but, yeah, that's no right. Problem. And I'm always happy for us to send out answers to questions that we haven't got time for. Um, to, to you that you can forward on to people because I know it's really important to answer everyone's question. And if anyone wants to get Ricky's contact details, they will be on the presentation, which we'll be saving to the website. So you'll be able to get in touch that way. All right. So Antonio Collages, I hope I got that right. Why is Tasmania only bans one type of plastic? Do they have other ways of processing plastics, e.g. in a cineration, et cetera? <laughs> uh, look, really, really great question. Um, uh, I'm not aware of incineration. I think that's highly unlikely um, because they are quite forward thinking and wanting to do a lot in Tassie. Um, the, I think the, the only reason is they just haven't had the capacity yet to go to ban more. And it's something that I know that they're looking at. And one of our supporters, Senator Peter Wish Wilson, who's a um, very long time um, a Senate, a Green Senator based in Hobart, they are very, very proactive and really onto the whole plastic waste side of things. So I think watch this space. I think there'll be some good upgrades on that coming. So if you are living in Tassie, and, and I've got staff who work in Hobart as well, um, it is, there is, I think there's a lot of things on the horizon there. So I hope that'll come up soon on the chart as a good thing that you can see they're doing more, more products, more products. Well, that's good news. Uh, next question, Jorg Acavido, could you please repeat the microplastic ingest analogy to eating one credit card per year and source of information would be great. Yeah, good, good question, Jorg. And I think what would be best is if I send you the, article where that came out from that's been actually around for uh, a couple of years actually uh, I think it's a year and a half uh, but basically what the article um, and the research shows is that because we breathe and we have a little film that we show which is about the air that we breathe and shows how the microplastics are being absorbed into our body through the lungs and absorbed into the system um, it's been calculated uh, methodology the calculation that it's the equivalent of one credit card. And I think the best thing, as I said, is that I get, again, get that article through for people to see because um, it's quite analytical, but it's good. It's good. It's helpful. Excellent. Antonio Collages says, thank you very much. He's learned a lot from this webinar. So good work, Ricky. Um, thank you. Next one, Karen Paranada. Hi, this is Karen M. Paranata of Clean, Clean Away Environmental Management Solutions Inc. here in the Philippines. 
Just want to ask, how is your take on the EPR law? This is already implemented here in our country and it was explained that we need to contain slash control or reuse 20% of plastic from the consumer or end user side. Realistically, we cannot control from that perspective, but we can transform or improve the process from the manufacturing side on how they use plastic on their products to release onto the market. Is this correct? Please advise. Thank you for taking time on my question. Yeah, complex question uh, in the sense that I'm not up to speed 100% with what's happening in the Philippines um, and in, in, in Indonesia as well. I know there's lots of different laws that are happening. Um, but basically by charging more at the front end of the product and encouraging the manufacturer to then make sure that the end of life um, transformation of that product gets reused is I think one of the biggest challenges. So is this correct? Yeah, pretty much it's correct. Um, but I think that again, there needs to be a bit, I need to find a bit more info for you on that because I'm not up to speed, as I said, with the Philippines. The whole idea of the extended producer responsibility law is to is to have that beginning from the from the beginning. The 20% amount, um, Again, I think that varies, so I'm not quite sure of that figure. Um, I'm not quite sure. Um, Clean Away is amazing and you do incredible work um, in, here in Australia as well. But again, Karen, um, it's something that I could, that one I would take on notice to get some more, some more information for you if you are interested. Excellent. Um, next question was from Shima. Zia Jaromi, I've got tricky names today. What about tyre wear particles? They are considered as microplastic and it has been shown that a huge load of tyre particles is getting to our waterways and ocean through road runoff and stormwater. Yeah, I know. That is, a, that again, that is like textiles and tyres. That's another whole, we could spend another hour and a half talking just about tyres and Absolutely. So every time uh, somebody puts their brakes on and the tire skids or the you know you're braking, you the wear and tear of those particles absolutely goes into stormwater, and it is a huge issue with my for, as for microplastics, as you quite rightly have said. And there is a lot of work looking at now about tires, how we dispose of tires, recycling of tires, and stopping tires actually from um, just a lot of tires just get dumped and go to landfill. But there are companies out there that are actually trying to recycle and are recycling tyres, um, but that's when they finally get them. So every time you change your tyre and you get a new tyre, the if you ask your tyre man or mechanic or whoever it is that does it or yourself, what they do with it, most of the time they wouldn't know where it goes and generally just gets dumped and it goes very often to landfill. But the, the ones that do make it to a recycling plant and they chop it up and reuse it and it's going into things like road base. Um, it has it is being used for construction in other areas re reuse is great but still when we're driving every single day we are creating inadvertently just by driving our car microplastics so it is it is a huge problem and yes you're right it is um, a microplastic all right so Karen just uh said thank you, Karen Paramada. So thank you, Karen. Um, Ricky, that's the end of the questions today. Um, just one last question for you from myself. Just how did you get started? Like it's a pretty amazing achievement what you've achieved with this plastic ocean Australasia, but how did it get started? Oh, look, thanks, Richard. And, and, I, and I do want to say thank you so much for having me and inviting me on board. And I'd love to meet more of the team and find out about your story. It sounds amazing. Um, I basically started in this um, business through uh, my dad, who had the first plastic, one of the first plastic recycling plants here in Victoria. Um, so when I was just a young, young person, I uh, was already doing sorting in the yard with the plastics um, way back when I was only like 10, 11 years old. And um, way back then, decades ago, it was very uncool then to be doing anything with plastic waste. And I stopped telling my friends at school that's where I was getting my pocket money from. But I went, I, I, that was my beginning of the journey. 
and I went off and I've been working in the environmental sustainability space for a long time, but I've basically done a big, uh, again, my own circular circle of um, being asked. When, so when the movie A Plastic Ocean um, came out and the founder of Plastic Oceans, Joanne Ruxton, who I worked with in Hong Kong many years ago, um, and the producer of the film, she asked, she appointed me and asked me to set up Plastic Oceans Australasia. So it was the last thing I ever thought I'd be doing, but it's basically, you know what they say, what goes around comes around. I started in plastics and now at mature age, I'm still doing plastics, which can be a good thing and also a bad thing. And sometimes it could be an ugly thing because I'm thinking, what have I done with my life? So there you go. But um, I'm hoping I'm hoping with the work that we do, we're told that we're helping make change. We're hoping very much that even what we do, even if it's only one business at a time or one school at a time or one council at a time, et cetera, that the change we're making is obviously going to be impactful long-term, not just with plastics, but all the waste streams, but plastic is the worst. Well, well done on getting it to where it's at. It's obviously got plenty of work left to do. Um, but it's fantastic to um, see you get that up and going. Uh, in terms of watching that movie, um, I understand that the, the film that we showed the first eight minutes of is available for everyone to watch for free. Yeah, so you can you can actually get it on YouTube. Um, the one hour, 40 minute film is on YouTube. You just put in a plastic ocean on YouTube and you'll get it. Um, if um, people are having trouble finding it, I don't think it is quite easy and it's free to watch. Um, uh, we just show the eight minute one because obviously we don't have time in this um, in this uh, forum to be able to do the whole thing. And as I said, the only thing about the film that is outdated is the numbers and the numbers are up. And that's probably the main thing for people to know. But it is a som a sombering um, film to watch. It's not it's not um, enjoyable. It's you know it really gives you that my gosh we really need to get going and doing something. But I hope that Pink Sun Rap will inspire people. I'd love everybody to come on and be part of that. I'd love to talk to people about anything else and their issues and any any way we can help people under our plastic oceans umbrella. I'd be delighted to help people in that space. Well, thanks very much, Ricky. I think we'll leave it there. And thank you, everyone, for attending today. It was great to see another big audience. And um, we will finish off there. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks, everyone. Have a great weekend. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.